John Reed with the usual suspect, Brian Summer. What's going on? Uh, pleasure to be here, John. Pleasure to be here. You know, it's so much nicer in this conference room that we're yeah. sitting in than being outside in that 115 degree weather in Las Vegas. We are in the Las Vegas cauldron, scathing heat. But we got our story. We are the Financial Force User Conference. This is the first time they were foolhardy enough to invite media and analysts. And they invited a pile of them, a good 30 or so uh, yeah. in industry analysts. A lot of VIPs, I would say, too. They, they got a good crowd of a crotchety, interesting characters here. Yes, I would say um, they're going to get more than they bargained for, I'm sure. Yeah, speaking of which, here is, here is your no-holds-barred rundown of, of what we learned the last couple of days. Um, but why don't we back up just for a sec, just for those who aren't intimately familiar with Financial Force, what would be your sort of short version of what the company is all about? Okay, so this is a company that uh, several years back, uh, Jeremy Roche and a few others at Coda, uh, a name that many might remember from the 1980s, uh, they fell in love with the new platform that Salesforce.com has. We know it now as Force.com. And they thought, let's try and build an accounting system like Coda on this platform. And in just 30 days, they had a somewhat functioning accounting system. And 90 days later, they actually had an application. Anyway, um, that product morphed into Coda to go. And then that became um, what we know today as Financial Force. And Financial Force is actually a joint venture kind of deal with... Um, ownership belonging to unit four of the Netherlands and uh, salesforce.com and technology crossover ventures. And it's no longer the only, if we call it cloud ERP, just for the sake of being generous with the term, because so many vendors are in that space now that don't resemble each other. Mm -hmm. It's no longer the only cloud ERP on the Salesforce platform. There's a couple others. Yeah. I mean, it, well, you got a lot of, um, You've got some pure play HCM vendors like uh, yeah. Lumes and Fairsale. Uh, you've got um, you got manufacturing providers like Kennedy and, and Rootstock, yep. and on and on and on. Yeah, so right. that that platform has become very prolific in the number of uh, right. application products that are out there today. And Financial Force is trying to excel by serving the needs of, in particular, finance users, but also professional services. Professional services automation is a big they, they talk a lot about this week. They talked a lot about being, they want to be the number one cloud ERP for the so-called services industry. So they're trying to look ahead to what the next generation service industry might look like. Everything from revenue recognition to cloud-based operating models, kind of in the era where it's sexy to say that everything's going to be a service, right? So even uh, if you're a manufacturing company, you're probably going to start selling all kinds of services associated with that, which you manufacture or you're going to make your the products that you make, you're going to turn them into services just by uh, yeah. uh, providing. You don't sell turbine engines. You sell uptime as a service or power generation as a service or whatever it is. And yeah. Financial Force wants to be all over that that business. That's that is correct. Their pitch. Yeah. Yep. So how are they doing? Uh, you know, that leads probably that's a great lead into my first real point, which is they're a little sometimes hard to figure out where the numbers are on this kind of company. But mm. after um, folks like you and I got our crowbars and the rest of the stuff out of our luggage when it did arrive, yeah. um, we uh, found out like they've got they've now got revenues over 100 million. Um, they're experiencing 40 percent year over year kinds of growth rates. Customer count, I think, now is up to. 1350 I think for total customers out there interestingly I when I was chatting with the CFO he commented that uh, customer account number is kind of temporarily kind of flatlined a little bit because the mix of who they're selling to has changed uh, growth is going up and usage and other you know uh, cloud stats are going way up but that's because they're getting bigger customers into the mix as maybe some of the smaller startup kind of firms in the past maybe um, either falling off or just uh, growing themselves. Which is what we see a lot in the cloud ERP space with vendors that get more clarity around the market they're targeting. And uh, we ended up, I ended up dinner with the CFO last night at, at our part of the table. I think you were across the room somewhere. Mm -hmm. And he was saying that, he's saying we learn a bunch from customers every year. I said, what did you learn this year? And he said, well, we learned that, that 
a lot of our professional services automation customers, they're a little more upmarket and they, they, they're kind of demanding about like a lot of features they want to see in the product. Here's what we need. Um, whereas a lot of their finance customers are maybe a little more lower mid market and their journey is more about learning how to run finance at scale. So they're more like, well, you have this feature. I didn't even know how to use that. Or so I think they're also figuring out what their customers need, which is kind of part of what they're doing right now is to clarify who they're serving. And that who they're serving, uh, my shorthand for that is what is the ideal customer profile? Mm -hmm. And I think in the past, it was pretty much anything that moved. And today, the, uh, we got a lot of focus uh, discussion going on at this show about who is that uh, ideal customer. I think it still needs some clarifying, but it's clear to talk like their new CMO, Fred Studer, and, uh, and their CE, the CEO's new and so forth, that clarity, I think, is a critical thing. Which, because I kind of stepped in it already, let's just talk about this one thing. There are a lot of new faces here at Financial Force. And uh, the you know it's a transitional time as the new leadership comes in who have new ideas and everything else about where they're going to go. But I think a lot of this transition is more oriented around uh, really cranking up the growth engine, and if we heard anything from their CEO and others, it's uh, the company's all about focus as it starts to move through a new kind of execution plan moving forward. And that ties in with some of the big news announcements from the conference, right? Particularly their ADP news now announcement, which is a pretty big shift for them in strategy. That's a big one. I mean, let's go back. Uh, let's get into the Wayback Machine yeah. and go to uh, back to November 2013 when in a, in a one-two punch, uh, Financial Force bought two Force.com built products, one from Less Technology in the supply chain management space and another one um, called Vana uh, that was a human capital product. And the company put a lot of investment, I know for sure, in the Vana product and built out a lot of the um, uh, additional functionality to round out the HCM suite. Uh, and, but right now, the company, I think, has decided that going into supply chain and HCM and all this other stuff uh, and having PSA and core financials is maybe a bit too wide for what they want to accomplish today. And do they really need some of that if the focus is going to be on a services kind of business world? Uh, that, I think, was the catalyst for why they decided to do the deal with ADP. I'm not convinced, though, that the ADP deal, it well, it's so new. I, that I realized by the kinds of questions that folks like you and I were peppering management with, they don't have all the answers yet on how they're going to do all the integration and where the boundaries are going to exist on the data model, for, particularly with regard to things like um, the recruiting, staffing, training, and so forth of professional service people. Is that going to be a PSA set of functionality or is that going to be in the HCM solution if it comes, if it's actually supplied by ADP? Yeah, I mean, one, one way I kind of think about this is that no business decision around strategic direction comes without risk, right? There's especially good decisions, they tend to invoke some risk. And in my mind, the risk of, of the decision around ADP, it's, it's a risk around, okay, so we're not, we're not going to prevent kind of a coherent, they, they made a point of saying we're not work day, right? So in other words, we're not going to build an, H, uh, an organic HCM financial solution that's all one sort of coherent feel. Like that's not what we're going to do. We're going to focus on this one piece that we think is particularly important. And as a result of that, not only the ADP thing, but to your point, a lot less talk about supply chain as well, right? Mm -hmm. Really focusing in on professional services and finance as really where they want to be. And that's the risk they're taking. And it's going to take time, I think, to see if, if that ends up being their best decision, but that's the one they've made. Yeah, and I mean, let's also look at the... Um the target date for when they would get any kind of final move off of customers over to the um, ADP solution. Right now, that's only like about 175 to a maximum of yeah. 200 customers. But that I date. I think they said 2023, right? Or 20, yeah, I heard 2022. But 22, that's, right. Okay, so, so that's five years from now uh, or more. And, um, and I think lots of things could change. ADP could change. Um, 
you know, a financial force could have a change of heart or change of mind. Customers could could get in the mix of it. Uh, that's not to say that I have qualms at all about them doing business with ADP. That, that not you know, not at all. It's just that the integration, I think, is going to be something that mm -hmm. they're that they're going to find out is probably a little more work and thought has to go into that than maybe what one might think at first blush. Yeah, I think that's that's pretty much the core of it. And I talk with one customer that is still absorbing the news because they had made the decision about a year ago to to go with they like the whole ERP play of combining HCM. So they have the HCM mm -hmm. from Financial Force. And they're a little taken aback. I mean, it's news, right? And and they didn't necessarily say this is terrible or this is great, but they said it's going to take us some time to think through this and how it affects our plans. And that's to be expected. And I think it, like I said, it remains to be seen if, if indeed, you know, financial force ends up stepping out in front with their ability to, to create this new services economy model, then maybe it's no looking back. Maybe they'll be fine. Yeah. Well, again, I just to be a hundred percent clear for the folks on listening in, this is a relationship that's not just ADP payroll, which I know is oftentimes what I think right off the bat. And that that has been the kind of channel right. strategy or partner strategy I've seen dozens of times with other companies. Uh, everybody seems to need partners or help in payroll processing all over the world. And because no vendor has been able to build a one size fits all globally. So partnering is not, uh, not at all uncommon in the payroll space, but this, this is, is the human full HCM. Yeah, this is yep. HCM and it includes payroll in there. And uh, so that's what makes this one a little more interesting anyway. All right. So what else do you want to cover in terms of, are there other challenges that, that you want to address or well um i think we need to hear a little bit more uh on the future direction i mean we saw some slides and stuff that pointed out kind of some product roadmap uh, information but most of that the time frame on it was 2018 possibly 2019 and not that i'm an impatient kind of guy uh but i think there's some bigger stories that need to come out related to big data artificial intelligence algorithms and the like and the reason in particular I'm focused on that for this vendor, Financial Force, is because Financial Force has been a long-standing um, advocate of Salesforce.com, and the two are, you know, have joint investment, and they share the same common platform. And Salesforce is sitting on some incredible assets like Radian 6, and they now have the Einstein technology and so forth. And all of that could be brought to bear to help financial force, help its customers do a better job of planning, budgeting, forecasting every line item on the P&L pretty much with bigger data, more algorithms and so forth. That I think is part of a story I'd love to see them flesh out and talk more about in subsequent uh, events or analyst briefings. I think the other piece of the puzzle that I, I was doing some digging on is around the partner strategy. There was some discussion around that yesterday in our group where we were told that they really want to build out their partner ecosystem from the, how many partners do they have now? Do you remember? I, so, somebody threw a number out and I don't have it handy on me right now, but. Um, they wanted to get into the several hundred range, I think, yeah. in a short amount of time. Uh, and there was a partner panel and some of the talk on the panel that I heard was a little bit old school to me as far as old school had an old school ERP implementation vibe to it. And I was looking for a little more discussion of sort of the next generation partners that I'm looking for, which are partners that what I think of as a cloud partner is thinking in terms of, uh, for example, being able to quickly develop apps that customers need in house. Mm. Uh, I talked with one today that I'm going to write a story on called Nubic. And the difference between them and a lot of the partners now is they come from the Salesforce side. So they, they have more than 10 years of experience developing apps on the Salesforce platform. And so mm. they had already built out apps for financial force customers. And the beauty of that for customers is that they're not, they're no longer stuck in that rigid model of SaaS of like, if you can't configure this inside your system, then you can't have that functionality. What's the point of saying that when you have a whole platform that you can use for strategic 
extensions. And so I was looking for more partners along those lines, and I think they're going to need more partners that can speak to that type of development as well. So, so let me pick up on that. I, I think you're onto something very important. I did meet some of the other partners here, and I think they were probably more along the lines of the Nubix kind of cut of cloth, which is a good to think, the thing to see. Even Aperio was here. Right. Um, the, um, if I could reframe it a little bit, what's desperately needed in these cloud spaces are both vendor, uh, are vendors who understand that the customer experience must be outstanding, not just during the sales process, but all the right. way through the implementation and even all the way through the end of life when you've dealt with all the continuing integration uh, hiccups that happen along the useful life of the solution. Um, that means that you don't want an integrator who's trying to drive uh, big implementation fees. You need somebody who's really smart, clever, knows how to get this stuff in and gets it done in a way that makes the uh, makes the experience so wonderful that no one will quit or drop off or contribute to the churn problems that yeah. they have on the revenue rack. Related that, you know, and we didn't really hear it a lot from management about what they're going to do to make that customer uh, experience still happen. Although in private conversations I had with a number of them, they all acknowledge that's important and they're, they're absolutely focused on it. Mm -hmm. I just, I think we were going to want uh, guys like you and I are going to want to hear more uh, concrete kind of proof points on that moving forward. Yeah. The other thing is we're going to, I think, and we didn't see a lot of this this year, but I think we'll start to hear more next year from them on vertical focus as well. Mm -hmm. They have some natural verticals that play well to their PSA strengths, but that I think will probably inform their partner strategy as well, right? So they were talking about obviously soft software and high tech is a, is a sweet spot, but right. there's others like healthcare. I know they've been looking at, so it will be interesting to see where they go there. There's and, tons. There's tons of them. Um, I I don't think there's a shortage of verticals. I think they're going to. Uh, what What's really needed is. Um, uh, like you said, the vertical expertise, KPIs, metrics, big data, whatever mm -hmm. kind of stuff that's going to help drive deeper kinds of um, operational insights and value that are going to make these organizations uh, succeed that use this kind of technology. I interviewed a number of customers. I have more to go. But one of the themes, the big thing I hear a lot about in terms of benefits has to do with more visibility into data, single source of truth. And it seems like that's what companies are struggling with the most is trying to make informed decisions around what's happening and, and the inability of so-called legacy systems to allow them to do that, right? And well, then they want to see it in real time. Right. Yeah. I mean, that they, uh, I, in fact, anyone listening on this, if your company still has like monthly feeds right, or weekly feeds, whatever, boy, you are way behind. And worse, if you have to go to another system and do an extract file and then reformat it so that you can then input it into another system, uh, you're, you're 20 or 30 years out of date. Just to give some context, I just did a video with MicroStrategy, which is a financial force customer and what they've done. They just recently went live on Financial Force, but they've already pulled Financial Force data into a data warehouse that they have that pulls in the data from all their relevant systems, serves it up into dashboards, which they call something like the periodic table. of. They have like about 40 different sort of abbreviated metrics for different departments that they worked out. Each one gets the information they need, whether it's professional services people mm -hmm. or finance people. And it's, a, it's an elaborate system, but the big difference that you see is like, yeah, this is all getting updated all the time now. This is not last month's data. This isn't waiting, when am I going to get my TPS report or whatever? And you do see that there's you, different. You'll get it when you bring yeah. me back my red stapler. But yeah, When I bring you the stapler, pretty much. <laughs> so anyway, I just think that's, that's probably the biggest benefit that I'm hearing from customers. Well, if I could put it, um, I know we're probably exceeded our time. I slide, think so. But what I was going to say, uh, on the positives, you had a fairly good sized crowd here. I think it was 1100 people yep. or so here. Now, granted that includes some partners and some, uh, you know, industry analyst types who rated the food line pretty hard. Um, yeah. but, uh, no, it was a pretty good sized crowd. This was really only the second big, I guess, user conference the company's had. I think they've had three total, but this one being in Vegas was probably one of the biggest and baddest they've done, which is a positive sign. Um, 
Before we wrap up, just one real quick thing. Revenue recognition. Oh, that um, was a big focus point. Yep. Yep. Um, and, you know, referred to as the Y2K for CFOs. Yeah, uh, yeah. Like how, how much stock are you putting putting in this and, and, and do you think they're well positioned around it? Well, sadly, anybody who knows anything about me knows I've probably done about 12 webinars on RevRec just yeah. last year alone. A little bit of a cottage industry you have going there. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, the money's been good. Um, <laughs> and like I said, I'll, uh, I'm not an accountant, but I'll play one on TV for the right amount of money. But um, RevRec is actually quite important because the dates are just months away for public companies and a little over, you know, about a year and a half away for the private firms. And I think a, way too many folks have done some maybe initial investigation of the requirements, and I think they have grossly underestimated how much work they're going to have to do to get their systems straightened out and ready to handle it. Uh, more importantly, I think a lot of folks are sitting on some obsolete systems or spreadsheets that may have helped them meet the requirements in prior years, but are not going to make them work going forward. Anyway, I don't want to turn this into a rubric lecture, but it is important. The real deal. It's okay. Oh, it's definitely the real deal. And uh, if Emerald Legacy were here, he'd be going like, bam, uh, you know, this is big stuff. And you think financial forces address that pretty well in there? Uh, uh, their solution, yeah, I've been through it. Uh, they did a fairly good job on it. And, uh, you know, everybody, um, all the major accounting vendors have pretty much upgraded their revenue accounting, revenue management mm -hmm. functionality to handle it. Um, and everybody's got a little bit different flavors on it. In some cases, you have to license a separate module. Some you may have to license a different one than what you had before. You know, and there's some help with the conversion, some less so. Uh, you know, this is one of those check with your vendor and get the to get the full four one one. But the message to customers is get on it. Yep. Oh yeah, get on it. Okay. Speaking of get on it, you're gonna have to get on a plane. I hope you don't get stuck on the Las Vegas tarmac because that thing's about to melt. Oh, it's gonna be so. good. Uh, I just want to make sure that when the uh, they pull the back on the yoke on that old uh, uh, crop duster, that the tires don't stick to the asphalt. Yeah. You know the Las Vegas shirt that I picked out for you last night. It matches the <laughs> tablecloth. <laughs> Which is Perfectly. pretty, which is pretty nice. It's a classy hotel look we got going here. Yeah, John. Uh, for context, <laughs> John came with me last night because my bags went one direction. I went to Las Vegas, and um, anyway, so he helped me pick out this lovely twelve dollars shirt here in Vegas. So, for all those people who get those other shirts to say, uh, you know, I, my kids went to Vegas and all I got was this lousy T-shirt. I'm wearing that shirt right now. Check it out on the Twitter stream, folks. It's a sight to behold. <laughs> Anyhow, thanks for joining me, Brian. Enjoyed it. Talk Appreciate it, John.